Welcome to Broadcoms Inc.'s second quarter fiscal year 2023 financial results conference call. At this time, for opening remarks and introductions, I would like to turn the call over to GU, Head of Investor Relations of Broadcom Inc. Thank you, Operator, and good afternoon, everyone. Joining me on today's call are Hoff Tan, President and CEO, Kirsten Spears, Chief Financial Officer, and Charlie Kawas, President, Semiconductor Solutions Group. Broadcom distributed a press release and financial tables after the market closed, describing our financial performance for the second quarter, fiscal year 2023. If you did not receive a copy, you may obtain the information from the investor section of Broadcom's website at broadcom.com. This conference call is being webcast live, and an audio replay of the call can be accessed for one year through the investor section of Broadcom's website. During the prepared comments, Hawk and Kirsten will be providing details of our second quarter fiscal year 2023 results, guidance for our third quarter, as well as commentary regarding the business environment. We'll take questions after the end of our prepared comments. Please refer to our press release today and our recent filings with the SEC for information on the specific risk factors that could cause our actual results to differ materially from the forward-looking statements made on this call. In addition to U.S. GAAP reporting, Broadcom reports certain financial measures on a non-GAAP basis. A reconciliation between GAAP and non-GAAP measures is included in the tables attached to today's press release. Comments made during today's call will primarily refer to our non-GAAP financial results. I'll now turn the call over to Hawk. Thank you, G, and thank you, everyone, for joining us today. So, in our fiscal Q2 2023, consolidated net revenue was $8.7 billion, up 8% year-on-year. Semiconductor Solutions revenue increased 9% year-on-year to $6.8 billion, and infrastructure software grew 3% year-on-year to $1.9 billion as the stable growth in core software more than offset softness in the brocade business. Now, as I start this call, I know you all want to hear about how we are benefiting from this strong deployment of generative AI by our customers. Put this in perspective. Our revenue today from this opportunity represents about 15% of our semiconductor business. Having said this, it was only 10% in fiscal 22, and we believe it could be over 25% of a semiconductor revenue in fiscal 24. In fact, over the course of fiscal 23 that we're in, we are seeing a trajectory where our quarterly revenue entering the year doubles by the time we exit 23. And in fiscal 20, uh, third quarter 23, we expect that, that, that this revenue to exceed a billion dollars in the quarter. But as you well know, we are also a broadly diversified semiconductor and infrastructure software company. And in our fiscal Q2, demand for IT infrastructure was driven by hyperscale, while service providers and enterprise continue to hold up. Following the 30% year-on-year increases we have experienced over the past five quarters, overall IT infrastructure demand in Q2 moderated to meet teens percentage growth year-on-year. As we have always told you, we continue to ship only to end-user demand. 
we remain very disciplined on how we manage inventory across our ecosystem. We exited the quarter with less than 86 days on hand, a level of inventory consistent with what we have maintained over the past eight quarters. Now, let me give you more color on our end markets. Let me begin with wireless. As you saw in our recent 8K filing, we entered into a multi-year collaboration with our North American wireless OEM on cutting-edge wireless connectivity and 5G components. Our engagement in technology and supply remains deep, strategic, and long-term. Q2 wireless revenue of $1.6 billion represented 23% of semiconductor revenue. Wireless revenue declined seasonally, down 24% quarter-on-quarter, and down 9% year-on-year. In Q3, as we just begin the seasonal ramp of, next, of the next generation phone platform, we expect wireless revenue to be up low single digits sequentially. We expect, however, it will remain around flattish year on year. Moving on to networking. Network, networking revenue was $2.6 billion and was up 20% year on year in line with guidance, representing 39% of our semiconductor revenue. There are two growth drivers here. One, continued strength in deployments of our merchant tomahawk switching for traditional enterprise workloads as well as Jericho routing platforms for telcos. And two, strong growth in AI inf infrastructure at hyperscalers from compute offload and networking. And speaking of AI networks, Broadcom's next generation Ethernet switching portfolio consisting of Tomahawk 5 and Jericho 3 AI offers the industry's highest performance fabric for large-scale AI clusters by optimizing the demanding and costly AI resources. These switches, based on an open, distributed, disaggregated architecture, will support 32,000 GPU clusters running at 800 gigabit per second bandwidth. Ethernet fabric as we know it already supports multi-tenancy capability and end-to-end -end congestion management. This lossless connectivity with high QoS performance has been well proven over the last 10 years of network deployment in the public cloud and telcos. In other words, the technology is not new. And we are, as Broadcom, very well positioned to simply extend our best-in-class networking technology into generative AI infrastructure while supporting standard connected connectivity which enables vendor interoperability. In Q3, we expect networking revenue to maintain its growth year-on-year -year of around 20%. Next, our server storage connectivity revenue was $1.1 billion, or 17% of semiconductor revenue, and up 20% year-on-year. And as we noted last quarter, with the transition to next-generation mega rate largely completed and enterprise demand moderating, we expect server storage connectivity revenue in Q3 to be up low single digits year on year. Moving on to broadband, 
Revenue grew 10% year on year to 1.2 billion and represented 18% of semiconductor revenue. Growth in broadband was driven by continued deployments by telcos of next generation 10G PON and cable operators of DOCSIS 3.1 with high tax rates of Wi-Fi 6 and 6E. And in Q3, we expect our broadband growth to moderate to low single digits percent year on year. And finally, Q2 industrial resales of 260 million increased 2% year on year as the softness in China was offset by strength globally in renewal, renewable energy and robotics. And in Q3, we forecast industrial resales to be flattish year on year on continuing softness in Asia offset by strength in Europe. So summary, Q2 semiconductor solutions revenue was up 9% year on year. And in Q3, we expect semiconductor revenue growth of mid single digit year on year growth. Turning to software, in Q2, infrastructure software revenue of 1.9 billion grew 3% year-on-year and represented 22% of total revenue. As expected, continuous softness in brocade was offset by the continuing stable growth in core software. Relating to core software, consolidated renewal rates averaged 114% over expiring contracts and in, our, and in our strategic accounts, we average 120%. Within a strate, with the strategic accounts, annualized bookings of $564 million included $133 million or 23% of cross-selling of other portfolio products to these same core customers. Over 90% of the renewal value represented recurring subscription and maintenance. And over the last 12 months, consolidated renewal rates averaged 117% over expiring contracts, and among our strategic accounts, we average 128%. Because of this, our ARR, the indicator of forward revenue, at the end of Q2 was 5.3 billion, up 2% from a year ago. And in Q3, we expect our inf infrastructure software segment revenue to be up low single digits percentage year on year as the core software growth continues to be offset by weakness in brocade. On a consolidated basis, we're guiding Q3 revenue of $8.85 billion, up 5% year-on-year. Before Kirsten tells you more about, about our financial performance for the quarter, let me provide a brief update on our pending acquisition of VMware. We're making good progress with our various regulatory filings around the world. Having received legal merger clearance in Australia, Brazil, Canada, South Africa, and Taiwan, and foreign investment control clearance in all necessary jurisdictions. We still expect the transaction will close in Broadcom's fiscal 2023. The combination of Broadcom and VMware is about enabling enterprises to accelerate, in, to accelerate innovation and expand choice by addressing their most complex technology challenges in this multi-cloud era. And we are confident that regulators will see this when they conclude their review. With that, <coughs> let me turn the call over to Kirsten. Thank you, Hawk. Let me now provide additional detail on our financial performance. Consolidated revenue was $8.7 billion for the quarter, up 8% from a year ago. 
gross margins were 75.6% of revenue in the quarter, about 30 basis points higher than we expected on product mix. Operating expenses were $1.2 billion, down 4% year-on-year. R&D of $958 million was also down 4% year-on-year on lower variable spending. <clears throat> Operating income for the quarter was $5.4 billion and was up 10% from a year ago. Operating margin was 62% of revenue, up approximately 100 basis points year-on-year. Adjusted EBITDA was $5.7 billion, or 65% of revenue. This figure excludes $129 million of depreciation. Now a review of the P&L for our two segments. Revenue for our semiconductor solution segment was $6.8 billion and represented 78% of total revenue in the quarter. This was up 9% year on year. <clears throat> Gross margins for our semiconductor solution segment were approximately 71%, down approximately 120 basis points year on year, driven primarily by product mix within our semiconductor and markets. Operating expenses were $833 million in Q2, down 5% year-on-year. R&D was $739 million in the quarter, down 4% year-on-year. Q2 semiconductor operating margins were 59%. So while semiconductor revenue was up 9%, operating profit grew 10% year-on-year. Moving to the P&L for our infrastructure software segment. <clears throat> Revenue for infrastructure software was $1.9 billion, up 3% year-on-year, and represented 22% of revenue. Gross margins for infrastructure software were 92% in the quarter, and operating expenses were $361 million in the quarter, down 3% year-over-year. Infrastructure software operating margin was 73% in Q2, and operating profit grew 8% grew 8% year-on-year. Moving to cash flow. Free cash flow in the quarter was $4.4 billion and represented 50% of revenues in Q2. We spent $122 million on capital expenditures. Day sales outstanding were 32 days in the second quarter compared to 33 days in the first quarter. We ended the second quarter with inventory of $1.9 billion, down 1% from the end of the prior quarter. We ended the second quarter with $11.6 billion of cash and $39.3 billion of gross debt, of which $1.1 billion is short-term. The weighted average coupon rate and years to maturity of our fixed-rate debt is 3.61% and 9.9 years, respectively. Turning to capital allocation, in the quarter, we paid stockholders $1.9 billion of cash dividends. Consistent with our commitment to return excess cash to shareholders, we repurchased $2.8 billion of our common stock and eliminated $614 million of common stock for taxes due on the vesting of employee equity, resulting in the repurchase and elimination of approximately 5.6 million AVGO shares. The non-GAAP diluted share count in Q2 was $435 million. As of the end of Q2, $9 billion was remaining under the share repurchase authorizations. Excluding the potential impact of any share repurchases, in Q3, we expect the non-GAAP diluted share count to be $438 million. Based on current business trends and conditions, our guidance for the third quarter of fiscal 2023 is for consolidated revenues of $8.85 billion and adjusted EBITDA of approximately 65% of projected revenue. In Q3, we expect gross margins to be down approximately 60 basis points sequentially on product mix. That concludes my prepared remarks. Operator, please open up the call for questions. Thank you. To ask a question, you will need to press star 1 1 on your telephone. To withdraw your question, please press star 1 1 again. Due to time restraints, we ask that you please limit yourself to one question. Please stand by while we compile the Q&A roster. <coughs> (laughs) 
And today's first question will come from the line of Ross Seymour with Deutsche Bank. Your line is open. Thanks for letting me ask a question. Hawk, uh, I might as well start off with the, the topic that you started, uh, AI these days is everywhere. Thanks for the color that you gave and the percentages of sales that it was potentially going to represent into the future. I wanted to just get a little bit more color on two aspects of that. How you've seen the demand evolve during the course of your quarter? Has it accelerated in what areas, et cetera? And is, is there any competitive implications for it? We've heard from some of the compute folks that they want to do more on the networking side, uh, and then obviously you want to do more into the compute side. So I just wondered how the competitive intensity is changing given the AI workload increases these days. Okay. Well, on your first part of your question, yeah, we. I mean, last earnings call, we we have indicated uh, that there was uh, a strong sense of demand, and we have seen that continue unabated in terms of that strong demand surge that's coming in. Now, of course, you we all realize lead times in manufacturing lead times on most of these cutting edge products is fairly extended. I mean, you don't make this manufacture these products under our process in anything less than six months or thereabouts. And while there is strong demand and a strong urgency of demand, uh, the, the ability to ramp up will be more measured and addressing uh, demands that are most urgent. On the second part, no, we always seen competition, and really, even in uh, traditional uh, workloads in uh, enterprise data centers and hyperscale da data centers, uh, our business, our our markets in networking, switching, routing, continues to face uh, competition. So, really, nothing new here. The competition continues to exist. And we all, each of us, do the best we can in the areas we are best at doing. Thank you. Thank you. One moment for our next question. That will come from the line of Vivek Arya with Bank of America Securities. Your line is open. Uh, thanks for taking my questions. Uh, Hawk, I just wanted to first uh, clarify, um, I think you might have mentioned it, but I think last quarter you gave very specific uh, numerical targets of $3 billion in ASICs and $800 million in, in switches uh, for fiscal 23. I, I just wanted to make sure if there is any specific update uh, to those uh, uh, numbers. Is it more than $4 billion in total now, et cetera? And then my question is, um, you know, longer term, uh, what do you think the share is going to be between kind of general purpose GPU type solutions uh, versus uh, ASICs? Do you think that share shifts towards ASICs? Do you think it shifts towards general purpose solutions? Because if I look outside of the compute offload opportunity, you have generally favored uh, right more the general purpose market. So I'm curious, how do you see this uh, share between general purpose versus, versus ASICs uh, play out in this uh, AI processing um, opportunity longer term? On, on your first part of your question, you guys love your question in two parts. Let's do the first part first. You know, we 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 guided or we indicated that for fiscal 23, that uh, the the revenue we are looking in this space is 3.8 billion. There's no reason, uh, nor are we trying to do it now in the middle of the year to change that forecast. Uh, at this point, so we still keep to that guide uh, that forecast we given you in 20, fiscal 23. We obviously giving you, you a sense of trajectory in my remarks on what we see 24 to look like, and that again is a guide is a broad trajectory of the guidance. Nothing more than that, just to give you a sense for the accelerated move from 22, 23, and headed into 24. Nothing more than that. But in terms of specific number that you indicated we gave, uh, it's, it's 
you know, we we stay by our forecast of fiscal 23, 3.8. Uh, frankly, because my view is a bit early to give you any revised uh, forecast. Then beyond that, on your most broad specific questions, ASIC versus merchant, you know I always favor merchant. Whether it's in compute, whether it's in networking, it's uh, di- uh, to, in my mind, long term, merchant will is eventually, uh, my view, uh, have a better shot at prevailing. Um, but what we're not talking, what we're talking about today is obviously uh, a shorter term issue versus a very long term issue. And the shorter term issue is, yeah, compute offload exists, but again, the number of players in compute offload A6 is very, very limited, and that's what we continue to see. Thank you. Thank you. One moment for our next question. And that will come from the line of Harlan Sir with JP Morgan. Your line is open. Hi, good afternoon. Thanks for taking my question. Great to see the strong and growing ramp of your um, AI compute offload and networking products. On your next generation, Hawk, on your next generation AI and compute offload programs that are in the design phase now, you've got your next gen switching and routing platforms that are being qualified. Like, Are your customers continuing to push the team to accelerate the design funnel, pull in program ramp timing, and then I think you might have addressed this, but I just want to clarify, you know, all of these solutions use the same type of very advanced packaging, right? Stack die, HBM memory, CoWAS packaging, and not surprisingly, this is the same architecture used by your AI GPU peers, which are driving the same strong trends, right? So is the Broadcom team facing or expected to face like advanced packaging, advanced substrate supply constraints? And how how is the operations team going to sort of manage through all of this? Well, you're right in that uh, we uh, this kind of AI product, this leading in this generative AI products, next generation, current generation, are all using very leading edge technologies in wafers, silicon wafers, and substrates and packaging, including memory stacking, and uh, mm-hmm. uh, but you know it's. Uh, from true from t- uh, consumption, it's still there's still products out there. There's still capacity out there, as I said, and this is uh, this is not something you want to be able to ship or deploy right away. It takes time, and we see it as a measured ramp over that has started in fiscal 23, and will continue its pace through to 24. And on the design wins funnel, are you seeing customers still trying to pull in all of their designs? Well, it's, you know, we are working, our basic uh, opportunity still lies in the networking of AI networks. And we have the products out there, uh, and we are working with many, many customers, obviously, to put in place this disaggregated, distributed, disaggregated architecture, uh, which uh, of Ethernet fabric on AI, and yeah, that's a that's a lot of uh, obvious interest and lots of design that exists out there. Thank you, Hawk. Thank you. One moment for our next question. And that will come from the line of Timothy R. Curie with UBS. Your line is open. Thanks a lot. Um, Hawk, I was wondering if you can sort of help shed some light on the general perception that um, all this AI spending is sort of boxing out uh, traditional compute. Um, can you talk about that, or is, is it that just CapEx budgets are going are to have to grow to support all this extra AI CapEx? I mean, it's, the truth is probably somewhere... In the in between, but I'm wondering if you can help shed some light on just the general perception that 
all of this is coming at the expense of the traditional compute and the traditional, you know, infrastructure. Thanks. You know, your your guess, your estimate, your guess is as good as mine. Actually, I can tell you this. I mean, you're right. There is an, there's this AI networks and this budget budget that are now allocated more and more by uh, the hyperscale towards these AI networks, but not necessary, particularly in enterprise, at the expense of traditional workloads and traditional data centers. I think there's going to be a, co and there's definitely coexistence, and a lot of the large amount of spending on AI today that we see, for us that is, is very much on the hyperscale. Uh, and so enterprise are still focusing a lot of their budget as they have on uh, their traditional data centers and traditional workloads supporting uh, x86. Um, and but it's just maybe too early to really for us to find uh, to figure out whether that is that cannibalization. Thank you, Hart. Thank you. One moment for our next question. And that will come from the line of Ambrish Srivastava with BMO Capital Markets. Your line is open. Hi, thank you very much, Hawk. I'm, I have a less sexy topic to talk about, um, but obviously very important in how you manage the business. Can you talk about um, lead times, and especially in the light of um, demand moderating, uh, manufacturing cycle times coming down, not to mention the six months that you, you highlighted for the cutting edge. Are you still um, staying with the 52-week kind of uh, lead quoting to customers, or has that changed? Thank you. By the way, it's 50. Yes, my standard lead time for our products is 50 weeks, and we are still staying with it because it's not about as much lead time to manufacture the products as our interests and, frankly, our mutual interests between our customers and ourselves to take a hard look at uh, providing visibility for, for us in ensuring we can supply and supply in the right amount at the right time their, their requirements. So, yes, we're still sticking to 50 weeks. Got it. Thank you. Thank you. One moment for our next question. And that will come from the line from Harsh Kumar with Piper Sandler. Yeah, hey, Hawk. I was um, hoping you could clarify something for us. I think earlier in the beginning of the call when you gave your AI commentary, you said that Gen AI revenues um, are 15% odd today. They'll go to 25% by the end of 2024. That's practically all your growth. That's the four, three, four billion dollars that you'll grow. So looking at your commentary, I know your core business is doing really well, so I know that I'm probably misinterpreting it, but I was hoping that that maybe there's not so many, you know, hoping that there's no cannibalization going on in your business, but maybe you could clarify for us. Answer that from an earlier question by a peer of yours. We do not see, obviously, we, don't, we do not see cannibalization, uh, but these are early innings, relatively speaking, and budgets don't change that rapidly. If there's cannibalization, obviously it comes from where the spending goes in terms of priority. Uh, it's not obvious to us there's that clarity uh, to be able to tell you there's cannibalization, not in the least. And, and by the way, if you look at uh, the numbers that all the growth is coming from it, perhaps you're right, but as we talk, if we sit here in 23 and we still show some level of growth, uh, I would say we still show growth in the in the rest of our business, in the rest of products, augmented perhaps that growth is augmented with the growth in uh, a, in our AI revenue in delivering an AI product, but it's not entirely all our growth. I would say at, at least half the growth is still on our traditional business 
The other half may be out of generative AI. Thank you so much. Thank you. One moment for our next question. And that will come from the line of Carl Ackerman with BNP Paribus. Your line is open. Yes, thank you for taking my question. Um, Hawk, you, you rightly pointed to the custom silicon opportunity um, that supports your cloud AI initiatives. However, your AI revenue that's not tied to custom silicon appears to be doubling in fiscal 23. And the outlook for fiscal 24 implies that it will double again. You know, obviously, Broadcom has multiple areas of exposure to AI, really across PCI switches, Tomahawk Jericho and Ramon ASICs and electro optics. I guess, what sort of opportunity do you see your electric optics portfolio playing a role in high performance networking environments for inferencing and training AI applications? No, uh, what you said is very, very insightful. Uh, it's a big part of our growth now in AI comes from the networking uh, components that we supply into creating this uh, f Ethernet fabric for AI clusters. In fact, a big part of it you hit on. And the rate of growth there is probably faster than our offload computing can grow. And, and that's where we're focused on, as I say, our networking products are merchant standard products supporting uh, the, the very rapid growth of uh, generative AI clusters out there in the compute side. And for us, this growth in the networking side is really the faster part of the growth. Thank you. Thank you. One moment for our next question. That will come from the line of Joseph Moore with Morgan Stanley. Your line is open. Great, thank you. Um, I wanted to ask about the renewal of the wireless contract. Uh, can you give us a sense for how much sort of concrete visibility you have into content uh, over the duration of that? And just you mentioned it's both RF and, and wireless connectivity. Uh, just any other additional calls you can give us would be great. Okay. Well, I don't want to be uh, wordsmith you or nitpicky. Uh, it's, it's an extension, I would call it, of our existing long-term agreement, and it's an extension. It's a col in the form of a collaboration and strategic arrangement uh, is the best way to describe. It's not really a renewal. Uh, it's, but the characteristics are similar which is we supply technology, we pr supply products in, certain, in a bunch of very uh, specific products related to 5G components and wireless connectivity, which is our strength, which is the technology we keep uh, leading in the marketplace. And it's multi-year, and beyond that, uh, I truly uh, would I refer you to our 8K, and not provide any more specifics simply because of sensitivities all around. Great. Thank you. Thank you. One moment for our next question. And that will come from the line of Christopher Rowland with Susquehanna. Your line is open. Mr. Rowland, your line is open. Okay, we'll move on to the next question. And that will come from the line of Toshi Ahari with Goldman Sachs. Your line is open. Hi, uh, thank you so much for taking the question. Um, Hawk, I'm curious how you're thinking about your um, semiconductor business long term. Uh, you've discussed AI pretty extensively throughout this call. Um, could, could this be something that, that drives higher growth for your semiconductor business on a sustained basis? I think historically you've given, you know, relatively, you know, subdued or muted growth rates for your business vis-a-vis -vis many of your competitors. 
um, is this something that can drive a sustained um, growth acceleration for your business? And if so, how should we think about the rate of R&D growth going forward as well? Because I think your peers are growing R&D faster than um, what you guys are doing today. Thank you. Well, very, very good question, uh, Toshio. Well, we are still a very broadly diversified semiconductor company, as I pointed out. We've multiple, we're still multiple end markets beyond uh, just AI, most of which AI revenue happened to sit in my networking segment of the business, as you all noted, and you see. So we still have plenty of others. And, and even, as I mentioned, for fiscal 24, our view is that it could hit over 25% of our, of our semiconductor revenue. We still have many uh, large number of underpinnings uh, for the rest of our semiconductor business. I mean, our wireless business, for instance, has a very strong lease of life for multi years. And that's a big chunk of business. Uh, and just that the, you know, the AI business appears to be trying to catch up to it in terms of the size. But our broadband server storage enterprise business continues to be very, very sustainable. Uh, and when you mix it all up, I don't know, we haven't updated our forecast long term. And so, Toshio, I really have nothing more to add than what we already told you in the past. Would it have make a difference in our long term growth rate? Don't know. We haven't thought about it. I, let, I leave it to you to probably speculate before I put anything on paper. Appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. One moment for our next question. And that will come from the line of William Stein with Truist Securities. Your line is open. Great. Thank you. Um, Huck, I'm wondering if you can talk about your foundry uh, relationships. I know you've got a very strong relationship with TSM, and of course, uh, Intel's been very vocal about, about, about winning new uh, customers potentially. I wonder if you can talk about your uh, flexibility and openness in considering new partners, and then maybe also talk about pricing from Foundry and whether that's influencing um, you know any changes uh, quarter to quarter. There have been certainly uh, a lot of price increases that we've heard about recently, and I'd love to hear your comments. Thank you. Thank you. You know, we we tend to be very loyal to our suppliers. The same reason we look at customers the same uh, in that same manner. Uh, it cuts both ways for us. So that's a deep abiding loyalty to all our key suppliers. And having said that, we also have to be very realistic of the geopolitical environment we have today. And so we are also very open to looking at uh, in certain specific technologies to broaden our supply base. And we have taken steps to constantly look at it uh, much as uh, we still continue to want to be very loyal and fair to our existing base. So, no, and so we continue that way. And because of that partnership and loyalty, for us, price increase is something that is a very long-term thing. I know it's part of the overall relationship. And, uh, and put it simply, we don't move because just because of prices we we stay put because of support service and abiding sense of a, a very abiding sense of commitment mutually thank you thank you one moment for our next question And that will come from the line of Edward Snyder with Charter Equity Research. Your line is open. Thank you very much, Hawk. Um, basically, a house stupid question. It sounded like your comments in the press release on the wireless deal did not include mixed signal, which is part of your past agreement. Um, and everything you seem to have said today doesn't uh, suggest that may not be the mix. You've mentioned wireless and RF, but uh, 
you're also doing a lot of mixed signal stuff too. So if you know you can find some clarity on that. And now also, why shouldn't we expect the increase interest in general AI to increase the prospects, if not the orders immediately for the electro-optic products that are coming out in fiscal I would think that would be um, much greater demand given the clusters and the size of these arrays that people are trying to put together. It would provide enormous benefits, I think, in power, wouldn't it? So maybe give us some color on that. Thanks. All right, you have two questions here, don't you? <laughs> and, well, it was a two-part question. I was going to do a three, but oh, I got right. off one. Oh, thank you. I love you guys with your multi-part questions. <laughs> Let's do the first one. You're right. Our long-term collaboration and uh, agreement that we, we recently announced in it includes, as it indicated, wireless, wireless connectivity and 5G components. It does not include the high performance analog components, mixing signal components that we also sell to that North American uh, OEM customer. All right. That doesn't make it any less, I would add, strategic, nor deeply engaged with each other. I would, uh, I would definitely uh, hasten to add. And on the second part, and if you could indulge me, could you repeat that question? Yes, yeah, so you talk about general AI and the increase in demand that you're seeing from um, from, from Hyperscale guys, and we we've already seen how big these clusters can get, and it's really putting I don't want to say stress on your networking assets, but I would think given given the size of the arrays we're facing that the that the um, the electro-optic products that you're, you're releasing next in Tomahawk 5 that you're releasing next year uh, that puts uh, um, photonics right on the chip would, uh, in, would become more attractive because uh, it significantly reduces the power requirements. And I know no one's used it yet, it's not been deployed, but I would think that uh, interest in that should increase. Am I wrong? You're not wrong. All this, as I indicated up front in my re remarks, script remarks, yeah, we see our next generation coming up, Tomahawk 5, which will have silicon photonics, which is co-packaging as a key part of the offering. And not to mention that it's going up to 51 terabit per second band, uh, cut, cut through bandwidth is exactly what you want to put in place for very high demanding uh, AI networks, especially if those AI networks start running to 30 over th to 32,000 GPU clusters, running at 800 gigabit per second, then you really need a big amount of switching because those kind of networks, as I mentioned, have to be very low latency, uh, virtually lossless, Ethernet lossless calls for some uh, interesting science and technology in order to make Ethernet lossless because uh, by definition Ethernet tends to have it traditionally, but the technology is there to make it lossless. So all this fits in with our new generation of products and not to mention our Jericho 3AI, which as you know, the router has a, a unique techno a differentiated technology that allows for very very low tail latency and in terms of how it transmits and reorder packets so that there's no loss and very little latency and that exists in network routing in telcos which we now apply to AI networks in a very effective manner. And that's our whole new generation of products. So yes, we're leaning into this opportunity with our networking technology and next generation products, very much so. So you hit it right on. And which is one makes it very exciting for us in AI. It's in the networking area, networking space that we see most interesting opportunities. Thank you. One moment for our next question. And that will come from the line of Anton Chakaibin with New Street Research. 
Your line is open. Hi, thank you very much for the question. I'll stick to a, a single part question. Um, uh, can you maybe double click on your uh, compute offload business? Uh, wh what can you maybe tell us about uh, how growth could split between revenues from existing customers uh, or potential diversification uh, of that business going forward? Thank you. Thank you. Good question. I, I, and I will I reiterate the answers in some other ways I've given to certain other uh, 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 audience who have asked me this question. You know, we we really have only one real customer, uh, one customer, and in in my, in my forecast, in my con in my remarks so far in offload computing, it's pretty much very very largely around one customer. It's not very diversified. It's very focused. Uh, that's our compute offload business. Thank you. One moment for our next question. And that will come from the line of CJ Muse with Evercore ISI. Hey, thank you. This is uh, Kurt Swarton for CJ. I um, wanted to touch on software gross margins, which continue to tick higher alongside softness in brocade. Curious what sort of visibility you may have into brocade stabilization and how we should think about software gross margins as mix normalizes. Thank you. Okay. Well, you know, the, our core, our software segment comprises, you hit it correctly, two parts. That's our core software products, revenues, and, and sold directly to enterprises. And these are your typical infrastructure software products and they are multi-year contracts and we have done and we have a lot of backlog something like 17 billion dollars of backlog averaging over almost two and a half three years and uh, every quarter a part of that renews and we give you the data on it it's very stable and uh, given our historical pattern of uh, of uh, renewing on expanding consumption of our core group of customers, we tend to drive that in a very stable manner and the growth rate is very, very predictable. And we're happy with that. Then we overlay on it uh, a business that is software, but also very appliance driven, the, sand, the fiber channel sand business or brocade. And that's very enterprise driven very, very much so. You're only used by enterprises, obviously, uh, and large enterprises at that. And it is fairly cyclical business. And last year was a very strong up cycle. And this year, not surprisingly, the cycle are not as strong, especially compared year on year to the very strong numbers last year. So that's well, the, this is the phenomenon. This, the outcome of the combining the two is what we're seeing today. But given another, my view, next year, the cycle would, could turn around and bro a brocade would go on. And then instead of a 3% year-on-year growth in this whole segment, we could end up with a high single digits year-on-year -year growth rate. Uh, because the core software revenue, as I've always indicated to you guys, you want to plan long-term on mid-single-digit year-on-year growth rate. And that's the very predictable part of our numbers. Thank you. And today's final question will come from the line of Vijay Rakesh with Mizuho. Your line is open. Yeah, hi, Hawk. Uh, just a quick, uh, I'll keep it a two-part question for you to wrap up. So um, just wondering what the content uplift uh, for Broadcom is on an AI server versus a general compute server. And if you look at generative AI, what percent of servers today are being outfitted for generative AI as you look, uh, you know, you, you have such a dominant share there. And where do you see that, that uh, 
uptake ratio for generative AI in year out if you look at fiscal 24-25? You know, I'm Thank sorry you. to disappoint you on your two parts, but it's uh, too early for me to be able to give you a good answer or a very definitive answer on that. Uh, because you know the, the by far the majority of servers today are your traditional servers uh, driving uh, x86 CPUs and your networking today are very very uh, uh, still running Ethernet traditional data center networking because most enterprises, if not virtually all enterprises today, are very much still running uh, their own traditional servers on x86. Generative AI is something so new and in a way so very, uh, what the limits of it is so extended that what we largely see today are uh, at the hyperscale guys in terms of deploying at scale uh, those uh, generative AI infrastructure. Enterprises continue to sh uh, deploy and operate uh, st standard x86 servers and uh, ne Ethernet networking in the traditional data centers. And so that's still, uh, so what we're seeing today may be early part of the whole cycle to answer your question, which is why I'm, I cannot be, I cannot uh, give you any definitive view, opinion of what, how, what the attach rate, what the ratio will be, or if there's any stability that could be achieved anywhere in the near term. We both, we see both running and coexisting very much together. All right. Thank, Thank you. you. Thanks. Thank you. I would now like to turn the call over to GU for any closing remarks. Thank you, Operator. In closing, we would like to highlight that Broadcom will be attending the B of A Global Technology Conference on Tuesday, June 6. Broadcom currently plans to report its earnings for the third quarter of fiscal 23 after close of market on Thursday, August 31, 2023. A public webcast of Broadcom's earnings conference call will follow at 2 p.m. Pacific. That will conclude our earnings call today. Thank you all for joining. Operator, you may end the call. Thank you all for participating. This concludes today's program. You may now disconnect.